Hi, everybody. Great to be with you today. My name is Stephen Rothstein, and I'm the Managing Director of the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. And we appreciate know how busy you are, particularly at this season of the year. And there's, there's an issue here that's so important in terms of federal procurement. So glad that you're with us and look forward to uh, this dialogue. Next slide, please. For those of you who don't know, Series is a nonprofit. We've been around for over 30 years. We work with some of the largest investors. Collectively, they have $60 trillion of assets under management. Some of the largest companies, again, working on their sustainability plans, working on policy at the federal and state level, and a lot of regulatory issues, uh, both financial regulatory and other, other things. Next slide, please. And we're thrilled that we've partnered with the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, uh, and they do great work on trying to harness the, the economic elements here. They have 180 members, collectively 800 billion in annual spend. Next slide, please. We have a, a distinguished group of speakers today. Um, uh, in, in just a minute, I'm gonna introduce Andrew Mayark from the White House, and then John Kostiak, a consultant doing some work with us. Then we'll hear the ideas and wisdom from both Ruth Cox and Steve Ellis. And then Sarah O'Brien and Anand will follow up from there. So really, this uh, is really the best and the brightest on these issues. Um, next slide, or actually, I think we can take down the slides. And now I want to introduce Andrew, as I say. Um, so President Biden's sustainability plan outlines an ambitious path to achieve net zero emissions from the federal government by 2050. And we appreciate his leadership and Andrew, your key work in that and your entire team. Um, central to the plans are powering the government's 300,000 buildings with 100% carbon-free uh, energy by 2030, electrifying the fleet of 600,000 cars and trucks by 2035, and reducing the carbon footprint of the $630 billion the federal government spends every year. The last item is what we're going to delve into today, and I, we're really humbled to have with us Andrew Mayock, the White House Chief Sustainability Officer for this conversation. Andrew, welcome. Thanks, hey, Stephen. I'm humbled to be here with you today and with this great panel. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for all the great work. As you know so, so well, the US government is the largest buyer of goods and services. And with last month's announcement of the proposed federal supplier climate risk and resiliency rule, that is a mouthful, I must say, uh, it will soon be the first government in the world. Let me say that again. The first national government in the world requiring major suppliers disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions and climate related financial risk. Tell us a little about the proposed rule and who do you think it will impact? Thanks, Stephen. Um, I couldn't be more excited to be here today uh, on the heels of rolling this out. Um, through President Biden at COP27 um, as part of his engagement there was in his speech. And then we also had uh, principals from the White House, including National Economic uh, Council Director Brian Deese and climate, Domestic Climate Policy Office lead Ali Zaidi, um, you know, lift this up and engage the international community at COP on this, while uh, Chair Mallory, myself, and others also uh, rolled it out domestically, engaged stakeholders, a broad group of straight stakeholders on uh, launch day. So I'm really excited to um, dig in here and have the opportunity to share with you, you know, what it is, uh, why we're doing what we're doing, why it's important, and what impact we um, think it will have. So. Um, I'd say a couple things in response to your question. You know, one is the world's largest buyer of $650 billion annually of goods and services. We face significant financial risk from climate change. And as uh, no one in this panel, and I'm sure nobody who's joined us on the video needs to be reminded of necessarily, we all face significant supply chain impacts over the past few years. So, you know, that is real for us. And our, and, our, and our contractors and our subcontractors. And as we took a look at that risk that we've been experiencing that we'll be facing in the years and decades ahead, um, we and the president um, you know, guided us to uh, take action on it and, and strengthen this, strengthen our supply chain and strengthen its resilience. So that's why we've come up with that title uh, that is a mouthful, as you pointed out, the Federal Supplier Climate Risk and Resilience Rule. Um, to you know, 
to, to really um, strengthen the supply chain, create greater efficiencies, reduce climate risks and reduce emissions. And in crafting the rule and designing the rule, put it together and putting it together, we want to make sure that we took a targeted risk-based approach by focusing on, on, on suppliers in three tiers. So a couple, couple words about the rule itself. Um, one is, you know, per the title and per the approach here, we're, we're focused on our base your suppliers. So that equals in that first tier, those who sell to us more than $50 million worth of goods and services annually. And the requirements for that first tier, the $50 million plus tier, means that they need to uh, uh, devote, they need to share their scope one and the scope two emissions. They need to, um, and, sc and scope three, and they need to share their uh, climate related risks, and they need to set science-based targets. And then there's a second tier in between 7.5 million to 50 million in annual sales. And for that tier, we're asking that they disclose scope one and scope two. Um, that's the full requirement is disclosure of their scope one and scope two requirements. And then there's um, the 7.5 million and below in annual contracts and they're exempt for this rule. So from a, target, from a targeted perspective, we're capturing 85% of emissions and roughly 85% of spend by focusing on those first two tiers and um, really, um, you know, seeking to to um, take a, a, a focused approach to the rule. That's um, th thank you so much. That's so helpful and so thoughtful. The way it's put together with those three tiers and really focus on the largest. And obviously, you said eighty five percent of the admissions. So that's great. Tell us why this rule is so important, both from a taxpayer perspective, from sustainability and others. Yeah, like I was um, noting, uh, you know, we've all experienced over the last three years in really meaningful ways. I don't think uh, uh, supply chain was such a um, universal phrase uh, for people until these last three challenging years that we've had. And we've certainly felt that through the pandemic, of course, but uh, it is also apparent as we work through the challenge that is climate and the transition that we're facing. And it's been a core focus of the Biden administration to make sure that we have a really strong supply chain as we move through, particularly this decade of action, as President Biden likes to call it, to make sure that we have the necessary uh, ingredients and tools and people to go deliver on that transition uh, that we're le leading. And so um, you know, that was a key part of driving the when and the why and the how of this um, and making sure that, that, um, that we're leaning in on this now. And so, um, and I, I think it's also, uh, when, you, when, you, when we look around at leading, leading uh, consumers in, in the form of companies and public sector, yes, we're the first when it comes to government and the public sector, um, and it's also the case that leading companies out there have also recognized the same risk, have also pushed themselves and their supply chain to move forward as well. And so um, we're also seeing this as a time of, um, uh, you know, the federal government coming back here and a lead by example approach, as President Biden often uh, states as well, he wants to put us back in that position as number, another way that we're uh, regaining that position in a really meaningful way through this rule. And the last thing I would say is that, um, you know, whether it's this, the rule that we're talking about today and the supply chain strengthening that we're doing here or the other parts of our agenda that you mentioned, it's also good for uh, business and it's good for public sector business to lean in here. And from our own experiencing experience, for example, since 2008, when the federal government started to really push on climate goals and energy efficiency um, and renewable energy, we've gotten to a place where we've had a 32% reduction in energy across our buildings our fleet, and our fleets. And that saved us real money over that tw time, $24 billion, almost $2 billion a year from that period, 2008 to 2020. So it's a, it's a key way to help deliver on this overall agenda to lean in through this rule as well as through the rest of the agenda. That's great. And, and we're gonna hear, uh, speaking of leadership, some private sector leadership later in this uh, uh, seminar, your facts about the 24 billion is quite impressive. 
so that's a great example of leadership. Um, in this proposed plan, you are relying on some private sector standard setters, TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure and others. Tell us the thinking behind that very uh, creative approach. Yeah, and referring to this as you know a targeted risk-based approach, we wanted we took a um, um, I think a, a thoughtful and rigorous effort in coming and in, in, in designing the the rule over these past many months. Um, and one of the features is what I mentioned regarding the different tiers as to annual sales and government. And the other feature that we wanted to make sure that we um, established in the rule to make sure that we had a transparent baseline. And so we, when we looked at that, we thought no better than a uh, way to approach this with uh, in, in making sure that we didn't find ourselves in a position where there's, um, you know, various innumerable ways to go translate the kind of submissions that we're getting. We would lean on really established voluntary standards, standard setting that's been happening for mainline companies and leaders um, for decades now. Um, and so, and we do it for, we lean in on that because, you know, half of our current major suppliers disclose GHG emissions and climate risk through CDP now. And a quarter of our current major suppliers, that top tier, have committed to science-based targets. So we looked at how to make this rule achievable, implementable. Um, it's a matter of, you know, um, raising the floor here that we've been at um, as a federal government and to utilize tools and approaches that are quite familiar with, uh, with, the, with the companies that serve us. So that's where I, we really leaned in from that perspective on those tools. And have you been working with the, all of the private sector groups, figuring out the, how, how they all work together with your rule? We've done extensive engagement. Um, you know, we're coming up on two year anniversary here of this administration. Um, and we've uh, had extensive engagement with uh, companies that serve the, the, the federal government, as well as um, those who set standards as we considered how to uh, construct and create this rule. So yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, built on um, an extensive amount of engagement with numerous, numerous companies. Um, and numerous others like Ceres, um, who are also are leaders in this space. That's great. Relating to what you just said, what do you anticipate will be some the reaction from the largest contractors, particularly defense contractors or others? How do you think they'll react to this um, proposed rule? Well, and it goes back to the design and what we've been talking about in the uh, creation of the rule and how we. Uh, intentionally went about it um, with 50% of our existing base of major suppliers already being on board. We wanted to take an approach that we could then move the other 50% up rather uh, rapidly. Um, and so what we've seen um, in the time that the rule has been out, what we heard in the time in uh, putting the rule together um, was, uh, you know, largely, not universally, uh, but largely, um, um, an acceptance and embrace about this is what we need to do as, as leading companies, this federal government needs to do as a leader back in um, the climate space. Um, so I'd say for the most part, it's been um, uh, an experience of affirmation. I would say there's a, and, and we have this ourselves as we do the hard work that we're doing in the federal sustainability plan that you, that you mentioned up top is this is um, you know not easy work uh, moving through the transition. It's necessary, this is an urgent time as President Biden uh, reminds us and we need to do this work, but it's not the easiest work either. So we're mindful of that. We wanna move through it through a graduated rigorous process. That's great. Um, I know I could ask a lot more questions. Are there elements of the rule or the proposal that you want to talk about. I know you have to run to other commitments soon, but is there anything else you want to add? Well, I just add, you know, by, by part of the rulemaking, I have the opportunity here to share the basic context um, and the rulemaking itself provides the opportunity for uh, the public to opine on it, to provide their feedback, their comments. So we welcome that through the federal government process. This is what this period is for when there's open comment period. 
Um, and uh, we look forward to that input and we look forward to finalizing the rule and doing the work ahead. And again, I just couldn't be more grateful to have an opportunity to spend time with you here today. I wish I could uh, stay longer with this panel, but I have to depart now, but I really appreciate the time that we have been able to spend today. And I really appreciate your focus on, on this really critical policy opportunity. Our, our, our pleasure. And again, thank you for all the leadership and so many issues. Just for everyone, we'll talk about this more at the end that comments are accepted through um, the 13th. I don't want anyone to interpret that it's Friday the 13th, but January 13th, uh, and we'll be sending, a, we'll be sharing a link later on. So with that, Andrew, thank you for this and for all that you're doing and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Stephen. Have a thanks. good conversation. Thanks, thanks, have a great day. Um, now it's a pleasure to introduce John Kostiak. John is a consultant. Uh, with his own practice, but he does a lot of work with Ceres, and he's going to help us go a little deeper. So with my colleague Becca putting up slides, I'm going to turn this over to John to kind of walk through things in a little more detail. John, welcome. Thank you, Stephen. And boy, that was a really helpful uh, conversation with Andrew. It really tees up my presentation well. I'm going to build on what he says and try to provide additional details about the rule, give you some of the key elements, and hopefully uh, further discussion a little bit. Uh, so uh, like Andrew, I put together a chart. Uh, he referred to uh, uh, tier one, two, and three slightly different than me, but we're talking about the exact same three th uh, tiers of requirements here on this slide. Uh, whereas uh, Andrew referred to the most robust disclosure as tier one, we're calling tier one that big screen of every single contractor that's registered with uh, the system for award management. And um, that's a lot of contractors, 490,000 in the federal uh, system. And the key message here today is 99% of them will not have any obligations other than the minimal disclosure to say, I am not doing any more than seven and a half million dollars worth of business with the federal government. So take that 99%, uh, they're off the hook. This rule is really focused on what we call two, tier two and tier three. Uh, the tier two are those between seven and a half million and ten million and fifty million dollars worth of business with the federal government in the prior year, and in that tier two, it's just one disclosure, which is now very commonplace in the world of climate risk disclosure. Scopes one and two uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and so um, that's roughly one percent of all those registered contractors. Now, the most important provision of this rule, perhaps, is those that governs tier three. Those are the more uh, robust disclosure requirements in this rule. That is only the those with 50 million or more than $50 million worth of business in the prior year with the federal government. And as you can see, we list here in the top uh, right the sort of the core elements of their obligations. Um, that is not exactly uh, federal, all federal contractors with 50 million or more, because uh, there are some categories that are, are accepted from this requirement, small businesses or nonprofits. We'll talk about them later. But as you can see, very important requirements to disclose emissions, not just scopes one and two, the direct emissions and the indirect emissions related to heat and electricity, but all the other indirect, indirect um, emissions, including those from customers and suppliers. So, uh, and then the, we're going to talk more about it in a moment, but those science-based targets. So we're not just talking about disclosure missions and continue to uh, uh, worsen the federal government's climate risk. You have to have a science-based target for reducing your emissions in line with Paris targets. Let's go to the next slide. Again, this is a really big deal because the federal government is the biggest purchaser of products and services in the world, and therefore it has an enormous carbon footprint. Most other large enterprises with a large carbon footprint have a holistic strategy for bringing down emissions. This is the beginning of the federal government's holistic strategy for tackling all those emissions in its supply chain, the so-called scope three emissions of the federal government. And so the government has enormous power to deal with this. Long-standing practice of the federal government gets to pick and choose which uh, contractors to work with. And for example, if you have a policy to discriminate based upon race or sex, you don't get to do business with the federal government. But we're now adding, this is really historic, a new definition of what a responsible contractor is. If you are a major or significant contractor, uh, you have a basic responsibility to your customer to disclose your climate risks. And that is now the definition of a responsible contractor. We think that is a really big deal. It sets a really important precedent. Let's go on to the next slide. So the way this rule works, it's really important to understand how the enforcement of this rule will work. Because 
not every contractor is going to need to do a massive disclosure of all of their risks to the people who are deciding whether or not to award contracts to them. In fact, those contracting officers are only looking at one substantive climate risk disclosure. They can only see one of them uh, that's delivered to the federal government. That's those scope one and two emissions. Otherwise, what happens is that there will be representations made by these major contractors to the federal government about the other climate risk work that is underway outside of the federal government. Two places where this work will happen at the CDP, the Nonprofit Disclosure Entity that works with many, many companies around the world. Uh, there will be a climate change questionnaire that contractors will be required to answer. And those responses will need to be placed on a publicly accessible website. And secondly, the nonprofit NGO that uh, works with companies around the world are on validating their science-based targets for reducing emissions. That work, the, the product of that work, likewise will need to be disclosed on a public website. The contractors engaging with the contracting officer of the federal government will simply state as a procedural matter, we have done that work. We've done the work with these two entities. We've placed the results on a public website. The contracting officer is not getting dealing with disclosures to the federal government of this matter. This next slide, let's go to the next slide, I'm ready, uh, is on the waivers. So all the requirements I have laid out to you to now have a number of waivers and exceptions and exemptions. I'm gonna try to do a quick run through of them. Uh, one is contracting officers can give a temporary waiver of up to one year if there's a good faith effort to comply. Second, the contracting officers can, working with their senior procurement officers of their agency, waive the requirements altogether for national security, emergencies, or other mission essential central purposes. And finally, if you are a small business and the contracting officer hasn't waived your requirements, then the SBA, the Small Business Association, can step in and do the waiver themselves. So a number of different escape hatches for companies that are struggling to comply with this rule. Next slide, please. There's another provision called exceptions that does not kick you out of the rule entirely. If you're a major contractor, more than $50 million worth of business with the federal government the prior year, you, your uh, disclosure obligations can be reduced dramatically, would be reduced dramatically to just the scope one and two emissions of tier two if you're either a small business or a nonprofit. And from the statistics that we've been given by the uh, folks proposing this rule, roughly one third of those major contractors who have 50 million or more of business are small businesses. So those get kicked out of the more robust disclosure requirements and just disclose scope one and two emissions. Next slide, please. The other part of the exceptions provisions of the rule are where you, if you're a contractor that fits one of these five categories, you are exemptly, exempted from all the rules requirements, essentially. Um, and those are Alaska Native corporations, other tribal entities, higher ed institutions, nonprofit research entities, state and local governments. And then this fifth category of management and operating contractors. These are typically the site operators of national labs other major contractors like that that have their own sustainable sustainability reporting through the federal government. So those are uh, significant exceptions because they, these entities will not report, disclose any of the climate risks we've been discussing. Next slide, please. Last slide, actually, for me. Um, just how the what's the timeline of this thing? Well, those more simplified disclosures known as scopes one and two greenhouse gas emissions will be expected to be completed uh, and submitted to the federal government within one year of publication of the final rule. With respect to all the other climate risk assessment work and work on science-based target um, with the SBTI, that must be disclosed within two years of the federal uh, register publication of the final rule. So that gives you a sense for the extra time that the uh, largest of the large contractors have to do that more robust disclosure. That's all I have for now. I'm really looking forward to the additional discussion and working with many of you to submit uh, uh, comments on this historically important rule. That's great, Sean. Thank you so much for that thoughtful analysis and really very deep. Um, just to follow up on what John's saying and what Andrew said, so there are many, prov many provisions that John just outlined that are in the proposed rule. If you love all of them, great. If you say, hey, I like some, but I think the waivers should be different or the exemptions or the timelines or the whatever else, um, send a note to the federal government, let them know. They very much want to hear your thinking. And again, between now and January 13th is your time to have that input. So 
Thank you, John, for that helpful comment. Um, I'm not, as I say, we're, we're blessed with so many uh, smart people here. I could spend more time talking to John, but I have to move on, unfortunately. So to Ruth Cox. Ruth is the uh, uh, principal of RFC Enterprises, formerly, she has a distinguished career, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but she had worked for the federal government uh, for GSA as part of this in sustainability. So she has a lot of deep and personal knowledge in this area. Ruth, first welcome, it's great to see you. Thanks, I'm uh, gr grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so Ruth, can you talk about how this rule might work in tandem um, with other disclosures the federal government is beginning to request in its effort to decarbonize industrial materials. And as part of that, explain this acronym EDPs to folks. Sure. So um, what you have here with this disclosures are corporate-wide disclosures. So a multinational business um, kind of takes uh, statistics for, for their operations um, at various plants around the world and you know comes up with averages uh, to report uh, on this. So what we've been working with are environmental product declarations, which, which actually takes the disclosure down to a product level and a discrete manufacturing facility for that product um, manufacturing. So this, um, the disclosure that we're talking about here um, is very high level, but it is a first step. And it's um, not uncommon uh, to kind of go through the layers, if you will, of disclosure um, to gain experience, to understand how to set standards. And many states and corporations already have started to set standards for performance um, at the product level. And, um, and then once standards are implemented and, and communicated to the, the market, then they can begin to start using uh, procurement criteria around these standards. So you can see that it, um, it really is a logical progression, if you will, of, of disclosure and understanding of the carbon impact of um, the manufacturing processes and materials that are used in the development of products that would be purchased, for example, by the federal government. That's, um, that's very helpful and very clear. As I said, you're, you're a veteran of the federal government, particularly the General Service Administration, now working with Third Way and others on industrial decarbonization. What would be the top message for contractors as they begin uh, uh, reviewing this rule, both for submitting comments, but as they get ready for uh, likely implementation in 23? Sure, there's a couple things. You know, one, uh, one thing that's important to note is that, the, that you know, the, the emissions um, criteria is just one of many, many criteria that are considered in a procurement process. So, uh, you know, we've been focused on the, in the federal buy clean uh, program on uh, construction materials, for example. So these construction materials, cement and uh, steel, uh, uh, you know, some cases asphalt or plate glass for uh, buildings, you know, they, um, those materials have to meet certain structural requirements. So we're not uh, abandoning the structural requirements in favor of more sustainable products. So it's important to understand that. Um, I think the other uh, piece of this that's important um, is that the federal government is trying to move an industry in a new direction. When, you, um, when Andrew spoke about what took place during the Obama administration as it related to energy efficiency in buildings, um, you know, that really did inspire huge, you know, markets for products that would reduce energy consumption or uh, change the types of, of fuels that are used in, in uh, heating buildings or cooling buildings and such. So um, this is the purpose of this is really to uh, begin this decarbonization process in industrial manufacturing and in industrial materials. So um, what we have are our early adopters. The the there are you know companies in the cement industry and in steel industry, asphalt and others um, that are already um, working with states like California or Oregon and others. Um, that are moving also in this direction and corporations like Microsoft um, that are starting to specify these requirements. So as the policies gain traction, you know, meeting these standards is going to become an important, you know, competitive advantage as you approach these, um, you know, markets for the materials. So I think it's uh, uh, 
important to pay attention to what's happening. If you want to participate in um, the federal process, uh, procurement process, you're going to need to compete on that level in addition to all the other factors that are considered. But it is the purpose, you know, going back to the purpose of the administration is really trying to move you know, the market in a new direction uh, that will ultimately deliver more sustainable manufacturing processes and more sustainable products. Absolutely. No, you're, you're, you're so correct on this. Clearly, I think the figure is something like 90% of Fortune 500 share some kind of GHG climate emission data already. They're not yeah. required to, as everyone knows, the SEC is considering options that, to standardize this. And there are a lot of companies, including our guest in just a few minutes, that where it's built into the fabric of the company, as you say, and hopefully this will move things faster. Um, appreciate what you said and appreciate Ruth, all that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, having me. Um, so now I'm gonna to turn to um, Steve Ellis. Um, St Steve is the head of Taxpayers for Common Sense. Before I ask you a question, Steve, just talk a little about your organization and what you guys do. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. And, and thanks, Ceres, for, uh, for having us here. So Taxpayers for Common Sense, we've been around since 1995, uh, been at the organization since 1999 and became president in 2020. And we're a national nonpartisan budget watchdog. Uh, we work in a wide variety of areas, whether it's national security spending or agriculture spending, obviously budget and tax issues, energy and natural resource issues, disaster spending, which is something I'll talk about as well. Uh, so this is something where we come at it from a what, what is a good uh, deal for taxpayers and what can help taxpayers out. So how do you see the issues of climate change and, and procurement specifically from a taxpayer perspective? Well, you know, if you go back to when Andrew's talking and, and we all kind of understand the disruptions of the supply chain that we've all seen the last few years, um, that increasing uh, volatility and unpredictability related to climate change impacts on that is going to, and, and disasters has had a deepening threat to trade and commerce and both globally and locally. Um, and so what we're talking about, though, is what are the costs of some of these disasters? What, what is the price tag for taxpayers? And we're not talking about sometime in 2050. We're talking about today. In 2022, there have been $15 billion disasters in the United States. And Hurricane Ian was the second most costly disaster in the history of our country, only following Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, and, you know, the federal disaster spending on hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires now easily exceeds the budgets of several federal agencies. Um, we're talking about national flood insurance costs, federal crop insurance, FEMA, Forest Service, and more and more of our tax dollars are going to respond in mitigating these climate risks. Um, but the same goes for the cost of climate change. It's like a like, like a tax, a climate tax uh, that we're all now paying and it's growing. And so government has long used strategic procurement to foster goals, whether it be set asides for small business or women or minority or veteran owned or Alaska Native corporations. Um, and so it makes perfect sense to put our thumb on the scale a bit um, to reduce climate risk and that cost on taxpayers. So, um... Thank you so much. And it was interesting in, in earlier, Andrew talked about how they saved $24 billion for taxpayers over, I think, I think he said roughly two or two and a half billion dollars a year. What do you think about that? Uh, it, it's great. And you know, certainly that's the shows the power of what you what what government can do. And just it doesn't have to be um uh overwhelming. It's just you tweak the system and because it's such a large uh entity and because we spend so much money small adjustments can have major savings. I mean, $24 billion or $2 billion a year was over a, like a 22 year period. That's, that's real money to real people. Absolutely. So in addition to direct savings, what do you see as the other short and long-term uh, gains from taxpayers from this um, proposal? Well, I think that in, in the short term, one is we're going to gain greater information, you know, as the rule is implemented and we learn more about uh, the, the impacts of, of the various corporations, and then also some of what they are, um, how, how they are uh, implementing and how we can adjust the, the federal acquisition regulations to uh, take into account climate risk. But in the long term, and, 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 and Ruth got into this, is that you know, companies are going to adjust. They're going to recognize that there's a way to get a leg up. And 
you know, if you talk to a defense contractor, you say, well, you have to disclose this information. They're going to disclose it because they're in the business of getting defense contracts. And if they can find out a way that they can get a leg up on a competitor because of their operations, they can build a better mousetrap or a more climate friendly mousetrap. They are certainly going to do that. And so that's something where we're going to get a, a, a benefit. And, you know, you talk about taxpayers, you know, I outlined the, the cost that taxpayers are facing today. In the long term, leveraging this federal purchasing to move markets and lower emissions is an effective use of tax dollars and will, will ultimately lead to greater savings. And I would imagine greater than the $24 billion that Andrew was talking about. Exactly right. That was from energy efficiency in the building. This is throughout lots of areas of procurement. Um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the groups you work with a lot is in, in defense contractors. How do you think they'll think about this and the impact uh, on, on uh, of this rulemaking? Well, um, we would certainly work on defense spending, which then goes to those defense contractors. And uh, you know, it's it's no surprise to most. Of, I'm sure anybody on here. I mean, more than half of the discretionary budget goes to the Pentagon. Uh, and DOD is the largest institutional consumer of energy um, in, in general and in petroleum in particular. So one thing that, it, that is, we've seen through successive administrations is Pentagon leadership has said that climate risk is a national security risk. And that we've seen places, you know, um, Hurricane Michael destroyed every single building or damaged every single building on, and, on uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. You have sunny day flooding at naval inst installations. You have high heat and uh, wildfires that implement tra in, uh, impact training uh, in areas of the country. So these are all real life impacts. And so it's in the DOD's interest to try to use their procurement dollars, and they spend a lot of procurement dollars to try to reduce those overall impacts um, uh, on the country. And it's, it's really, it's just a, another form of the power of the purse, you know, and it, and it just makes sense. Um, so I, I wrote a piece back in March, uh, an op-ed recommending that the Pentagon use weighted criteria and its RFPs, request for proposals, to prioritize contractors who practice methods to significantly reduce carbon emissions. I mean, taxpayers, as much as anybody, have skin in this game, and it's 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 in our interest that we use our purchasing power to save ourselves money in the long run. And the Pentagon gets that. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and the Pentagon has said, and a number of senior military officials have said, from a national security perspective climate is directly and indirectly one of the biggest risks our country has. Thank you, Stephen, for, for the work, for joining us today and for sharing the taxpayer's perspective. I appreciate it. Um, Absolutely, thanks for having me. Um, again, we could spend all of our time with each one of our speakers, but in the interest of time, have to move on. So I wanna introduce Sarah O'Brien. Um, as I say, Sarah is a partner in this and she's put together an, an amazing organization uh, thinking about uh, sustainability in the supply chain. So Sarah, if you want to just talk a little bit about your great group, what you're doing, and then introduce our distinguished colleague from Microsoft, Sarah. Sure, I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks to Sirius for the invitation to put this together. together. And um, this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. I've been working on sustainable procurement for about 20 plus years, and it's great to see this topic, this strategy, this area of work come to the fore. Um, because I think that for, for those of us who've been dedicated to this, we've realized long ago that, as you say, that the, the power of the purse, you know, the customer is always right, is what it comes down to at its simplest. Um, if a major customer wishes a supplier to conduct their business in a certain way, which meets the needs of that customer, either the way they deliver the product, the attributes of that product, or even in this instance, how they might be engaging with their supply chain and so forth. That becomes, um, it's not a, a fight. It's more, okay, well, how can I do that? How long will it take? Is this a reasonable request of me? And I'll change. Um, so it, it's um, working in procurement to include not only the price, performance, and delivery um, requirements that are standard to procurement, as Ruth pointed out, we're not throwing those out the window. We're adding to them added value um, to communities, to the health of the nation, to the budget, as Steve points out. Um, so I think that this is a really, you know, the federal government has led on this for a long time, GSA, 
and federal procurement um, overall. Um, the GSA and, and uh, Department of Energy are members of ours because they want to align with the market as well as lead the market. Um, and I, I really liked what Andrew talked about, and I'll, I'll ask our next guest about it, but about looking for those solutions that are, that are in commerce, that are already in play and enabling the federal government with its massive purchasing power to really just increase the volume and importance of um, the, you know, the, the market's need to meet those, those existing requirements. So I'm going to not just opine on that and not just talk about what I've heard from our members sort of in general. I, I wanna uh, introduce our next um, speaker, Anand Narasimhan, who is with Microsoft. Anand is the general manager of cloud supply chain sustainability, which is a vast um, field. I know Anand and his team have been focusing on innovations across the supply chain in support of Microsoft's commitment to sustainable carbon negative future. And Anand, you can fill us in a bit on that, that massive commitment that Microsoft has made independent of this procurement regulation. Um, but Anand has, uh, has worked in a, a number of really interesting sustainability contexts. Uh, he was managing director at SIMS, which is the leading global asset disposition and recycling company for electronics hardware. Uh, he was also a co-founder of Voxiva, which deployed mobile health services across 17 countries, including the first nationwide digital disease surveillance systems in Peru and Rwanda. I, I love the breadth of your background, Adam. So um, he has patents, publications, he's advised many global organizations and has served on nonprofit advisories and boards, including the Grameen Foundation and the Simha Foundation. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to sort of Bring us back on to, um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us, um, and especially for joining us from the UK, where you are well into your evening. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to bring us back to, to what Andrew Mayock said early on, which was, again, that, that the federal government wanted to um, align with best practice in the marketplace already. They don't want to create a, a, a new or, or divergent requirement. And I wanted to, you know, just sort of just ask for your comment on that. Do you see this as this proposal as, you know, breaking new ground or really kind of consistent with what you see in the marketplace with what you're being asked by your by your major customers? Yeah, firstly, thank you for inviting me here. And it's nice to see you again, Sarah. Um, Broadly, I feel like this it's very much an alignment. We've been at this for some time. Um, if you think about uh, uh, the CDP reporting, we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, the alignment with science-based targets initiative, I think is a great step in the right direction as well. Uh, moving from just reporting to also setting targets. I think it uh, it makes sense, not just uh, to, to align with those two, but also in many ways, it, Creates a level of uh, creates a common ground for a lot of people to say that we have now one set of uh, ways to report and one set of ways to set targets, and you don't have to deal with all the complexities of multiple metrics and multiple reporting systems and standards and so on. Um, it helps a lot. We've been we've been aligned to this. So Microsoft reports to CDP. We're part of SBTI. We work with our suppliers to require them to report to CDP as well. Uh, so I think it's. Uh, uh, it's not surprising, but I'm very pleased to see this happening because I think it is a it is definitely moving in the right direction, uh, and being one of the largest uh, um, uh, buyers, well, the largest buyer in the world, they're certainly in a position to do this um, uh, at scale and to influence everybody else in the industry to do this as well. So I think it's a very positive move. Mm -hmm. It's great. I, I that's what I've heard generally, but it's 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 good to know that it's not a that it's not unexpected or um, something that people will have to see a, a huge um, uh, requirement to ramp up some new effort uh, in order to meet. And I wondered, um, you know, in, in general, I know you've spoken to, to Microsoft's um, 
you know, to Microsoft's commitment to the CDP and to, uh, to science-based targets, do you think this is, um, uh, you know, something that is general in the markets? Are you seeing, I know, I, I guess I'm thinking about the context, which is that every day a new, you know, clean tech startup announces that they've found the new way to gather information on climate emissions and, and so forth. Um, do you think that this helps um, kind of consolidate and clarify um, methods and strategies, or does it seem to, to you know, pose any barrier? Yeah, I think broadly it does help to consolidate, right? Uh, going back to what Andrew spoke at the beginning of the conversation, he talked about how they took this very methodical approach to looking at who contributes to the majority of all emissions. I think he said 80, 85% of emissions from a certain set of suppliers, and they're focused on, on those reductions. It, it, it resonated with, with us as well, with me as well, because we have exactly the same approach. Um, a small set of suppliers contributes to more than 80, 85% of all our emissions. We look at focusing on them. And then whether it's um, the science-based targets and setting uh, very, very clear uh, targets, watching them over time. Th this is exactly what we need to do. It's not easy work. It's very difficult work. Is this going to be adopted universally? Well, it takes time, right? Um, the ones who can, should, and are doing it already, we're seeing that ourselves with our own supply base. There are suppliers, of course, who will take a lot longer to do this. And I think this... Uh, gives them some momentum to move in the right direction because it sort of says that these are certain steps that you must take. I don't think they're um, complex steps to take in the sense of making a commitment. The actual work is difficult, of course, uh, but you have to get on the path. And I think whether the ways in which you measure today with the GHG protocols or other methods, um, these will keep evolving over time. And I think we'll get better as we do it, as we do the really hard work, We'll get better at doing it. We'll get better metrics, and you know the the entire ecosystem will start to evolve in the right direction. But I think it's a fantastic starting point. It doesn't mean it's the end. It just means it's a very good set of common beginnings. Yeah, yeah, and we've heard very much from members that that you know, in this as in all things, the best the best case scenario both for procurement the purchasing and sourcing side and for the supplier side is clarity and consistency in the marketplace. So aggregated demand mm -hmm. makes it much easier for a supplier like yourselves to say, okay, this is a confirmed direction we can go that will be rewarded. You know, that, that helps um, just make the path a lot clearer yeah. um, and, and simpler, which is great. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think those are the real questions that arise sometimes in these contexts when large purchasers make um, very specific and clear asks are, you know, I, it was interesting. I, I went into to read the comments, a few of the comments that are uh, already uh, in the, the Federal Register in the, the uh, area where we'll share the link to. And there's a sort of um, standard oh, this is going to put a lot more burden on people. This is going to be a lot more complicated. And in fact, what I'm hearing from you and from others is it reduces burden. It, it in some ways simplifies and perhaps reduces the complexity of, of compliance. Um, do you see that as, um, you know, it, it, maybe this is not your, your area, but um, do you see that as, as increasing your ability to focus on forward progress rather than focusing on bean counting in 20 different ways? Um, is that sort of an enabler? Yeah, no, it's actually quite relevant to our space as well, to my space as well. Um, because on the one hand, if you think about uh, our role as contractors, but also our role as buyers of things, um, and it works very similarly in both directions, to be honest, um, we don't want multiple standards. Our suppliers don't want multiple standards because uh, the ways in which they report to us should be very similar to how they report to other buyers. Uh, similarly, if we're working or competing in the market to offer our services to, to, to buyers, uh, it should be one set of standards. We want to be measured the same way as others would be because it, on the one hand, levels the playing field. 
makes brings a lot of clarity uh, and we're we're able to differentiate better as well right so I, I think it helps on all accounts and we we do play on both sides of this as I think do most people within this ecosystem so I think it's beneficial on all accounts to have a one common set of approaches uh, one way of measuring things one way of reporting things um, and as those things change to all have it happen together and I wonder um if this is something that um, you see any um, interest or groundswell with other large purchasers, uh, gov national governments. I know that at the beginning of the, the uh, session, we were saying this is the first national government that has put this very clear demand in place. And whether this is maybe a model that, that other national governments are, or the EU confederated government are considering um, again, to increase that consistency and ease of compliance. I think that's a very interesting comment. Yes, I think as a first, it's fa it's fantastic. It certainly shows one way to do things, and I think it's a good way to do things as well. There is a lot of movement in the EU as well, certainly, and in many ways, I think the EU has been leading the space for a long time. Um, not so much in consolidating this view of saying, as a very large purchaser, these are the steps we're going to put in place. But to require an entire group of countries across the EU to do similar things, right, in in ways of standardizing how they're approaching um, reporting requirements, um, movement of goods, or electronic waste, or circularity, or emissions reduction, uh, various aspects of sustainability and how you standardize those are coming together. Um, but but this is something uh, that's a little different. Uh, it's saying if I'm going to buy and I'm a very large buyer, these are things you must do across the entire ecosystem. And it's a very powerful statement to make. I do hope and expect that the EU and others will do similar things or take a lesson from from the US. Um, and I think in hopefully in very similar ways as well. Uh, I think uh, with the CDP or the Science Based Targets Initiative, um, the or the, or the, or the green as the GG G G protocols. These are very standardized ways. Most companies in the world are adopting some form of these anyway. So my hope is that there won't be a very large departure, at least between the US and the EU um, and other countries that remains to be seen. But I think uh, all of this is moving very rapidly now. So I, I would uh, hope that there will be some consensus in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a global firm like yours, again, yeah. multiply, multiplying demands, not helpful. Um, I know we have some um, suggestions, some links we want to share and so forth. So, Steve, do you want me to turn it back to you at this point so you can kind of round us off with those opportunities that we're going to share with our listeners? Sure. But before we do that, I just want to thank both of you. And thank you for the yeah. work at Microsoft. Um, I mean, you're a leader in so many areas, getting to your bold commitment. And obviously, your supply chain affects so many elements of, of the society. Uh, so it's a real leader in that sense. And Sarah, you and your, I think it's 180 members, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that shows just how much interest there is in the private sector on these procurement issues. And as I say, when, when you, when you, uh, you obviously started this work, you said you've been doing it 20 years when you were four years old. So, but appreciate That's the, it. the, the work that uh, doing this to lay, lay the important foundation. So thank you both. Yeah, if I can ask my colleague just to put slides back up again. Um, so as we said earlier, we hope, the federal government hopes that you submit a comment by uh, January 13th. When this uh, goes out, you'll be able to uh, hyperlink on the read here in terms of the rule, uh, take a look at it, encourage you to do that. We've also prepared a, a template letter for your consideration. Obviously, we hope you submit a letter no matter what you say. But if you want something to get you started or think about it, you can use that. Um, and then we've also included my email and John's email that if there are questions, uh, the more comments that they get and the more specific comments that they get, um, whether you like something or not, you think it should be changed or amended, uh, this is the time. And I can tell you from other um, uh, comment period with other agencies, that, that the agencies really do listen to this and the White House is looking. So hope that you'll all have a voice uh, in this incredible process. Next slide, please. 
I also hope that uh, many of you, again, we work with on a variety of things, but we're having an in-person conference in New York City in March, 22nd to the 24th, global, Series Global. There's information on, on our website. Hope that you'll consider joining us for that. There will be discussion on a lot of issues on sustainability and get to hear from leaders on the investment world and on the corporate world and policy world. So hope you're going to join us. Um, next slide is evaluation. We want your feedback. Was this helpful? How can we be more helpful going forward? So you can take a picture of this. Um, also, again, when it goes out, you'll, you'll get it again. And if there are ways we can add to this, let us know. So next slide, which is our last one, is thank you. We know how busy each of you are. There's a lot on your plate, again, as I said earlier, particularly at this season of the year. So thank you for joining us. And we hope that uh, this has been helpful to learn about what the federal government is doing and hope that you will have a voice and submit comments by January 13th. Thanks so much and have a great day, everybody.